So good afternoon and uh, welcome to the closing plan panel of the 2018 Public Law Conference. On behalf of the Law School and the conveners, I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which the Law School stands. As is convention with the Public Law Series, for the closing panel, we've invited four speakers to offer their thoughts on the conference and to reflect on its themes in the light of the papers delivered and discussions had over the preceding two and a half days. Uh, we're privileged to have a distinguished, uh, an outstanding panel of distinguished public lawyers drawn from the academy, practice, and bench. Our speakers are seated left uh, to right, Dame Ellen France of the New Zealand Supreme Court, Professor Benedict Kingsbury of NYU Law School, uh, Kristen Walker QC, the Solicitor General of Victoria, and Professor Emeritus Mark Aronson of UNSW. Each will address us in turn, and Dame Alan France is our first speaker. Excuse me, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Greetings, everyone. In thinking about what I might say about the conference themes in these remarks, I looked up various definitions of frontiers. The Cambridge England di Dictionary, which seemed an appropriate source given one half of our conference organisers, says that a frontier is also a border between what is known and not known. Well, for my part, the conference papers and the associated discussions have certainly increased the sum of my knowledge. Indeed, I'm spoilt for choice in terms of material in which I could comment. I think the organisers and all of those presenting papers are to be congratulated. I want to focus on a couple of aspects. First, remedies, and second, the interrelationship between public law and the criminal law or the criminal justice system. The points about remedies go to both the boundaries between public law and other areas and within public law itself. My comments about the intersection with the criminal law are directed more to the, towards the frontiers of public law vis-a-vis -vis other areas of law. Questions of remedies arose for me first out of the papers about government contracting decisions. The point was well made that as governments change the way that they do business and provide services, issues arise as to the appropriate public law response. The issue was kick-started, and I'm trying to think of an appropriate football or soccer metaphor given the forthcoming cup, um, by Ken Haynes' excellent paper, and then the issues were developed further by both Anne Davies and Janet McLean. Both Anne and Janet noted that there are opportunities for judicial review of government contracts, but there are barriers. In the New Zealand context, the Supreme Court said with reference to cases like Mercury Energy, that judicial review was available in relation to decisions relating to the contract for a sale of a farm by one of our state-owned enterprises with a special context, and by that the court meant broadly the Treaty of Waitangi, meant that the decision makers were exercising public power. So this was in the category of, in terms of Matthew Palmer's categorisation of divesting of assets. In terms of remedy, the majority of the court was of the view that the court would not set aside a contract in a judicial review case only for lack of capacity. The court saw the issue rather as one of the extent of prejudice to third parties. Questions of prejudice arose there because the case concerned decisions about a concluded sale of land to a third party. The sale deprived the plaintiffs of the opportunity to obtain the land to settle their Treaty of Waitangi claim. The sale only came about because there had been a mistake in the application of procedures for state-owned land designed to ensure land could be available for treaty settlements. Declarations were made that there had been a wrongful exercise of public power, but the court did not set aside the agreement because of the prejudice to the purchaser of the land. One commentator accordingly described the plaintiffs as having won the battle but lost the war. <laughs> 
I mention the case simply as an illustration of the difficulties, particularly in terms of fashioning remedies as the courts try to grapple with the changing way in which governments do business. The papers on the topic of government contracting have helped us to focus on these questions and on the need to keep thinking about them. While I think that in their papers, both Anne Davies and Janet McLean were suggesting more creative approaches, Owen Carolan raised some questions about the creativity of both the Irish and New Zealand courts in relation to declarations of inconsistency. In New Zealand, as has been discussed in various sessions, there is no power in our Bill of Rights to make a declaration of inconsistency. And I thought that Nick Petrie, in one of the very many interesting doctoral papers, uh, put it quite well this morning when he said, the New Zealand courts have danced around the topic of declarations of inconsistency. Recently, our Court of Appeal in the Taylor case, discussed in a number of sessions, has said that a declaration can be made. As uh, Owen noted, an appeal from the New Zealand Court of Appeal case that he spoke about has been heard by the Supreme Court and a decision is awaited, so watch the space. I turn then to the intersection with the criminal law. That is an area, as the paper by David Feldman illustrates, where public law in his jurisdiction has expanded into other areas with the extension of judicial review to decisions made as part of the criminal justice process and to prisons. I was interested in the features he identified as prompted the, prompting the extension, which included various social factors. I think that illustrates one of the themes of the conference for me, which is how public law responds to changing conditions. In the New Zealand context, we had a recent case dealing with the fallout from a horrific explosion in a coal mine, resulting in the deaths of a number of people. <coughs> It led to charges being laid against the mining company and its chief executive officer. The company was found guilty after a formal proof hearing and was ordered to pay over $3.4 million by way of reparation. By that point in time, it couldn't pay because it was in receivership. Charges against the chief executive officer were dropped on the basis that no evidence would be led if he paid the reparation, which he did. There was judicial review proceedings brought by the family of two men who died in the explosion, and they challenged the decision not to offer any evidence against the chief executive officer. The argument was that that decision was unlawful because it was based on a bargain to stifle the prosecution. The trial court accepted the argument that the that the, made by the Crown that the decision was not one amenable to judicial review, was not an abuse of power, and nor were there exceptional circumstances. The Court of Appeal said the decision was reviewable, although it said that the intensity of review and availability of review would be constrained. But the Court of Appeal found that there was no bargain to stifle the prosecution. When the matter came to the Supreme Court, it was accepted by all parties that judicial review was available. The court treated the matter as an unlawful bargain where the central feature of the arrangement with the chief executive in the course of the negotiations was that the charges would be dropped if the money was paid. I refer to this as illustrating even, with the, even within the process of a case within the courts, through the court process, one can see the expansion of public law, which David Feldman refers to. The other case I mentioned briefly was a judicial review decision in relation to a decision um, by prison authorities to revoke an authorisation previously given to a prisoner, Mr Smith, that he could wear a hairpiece. Now, I need to put that in some context. Under the New Zealand prison legislation, it's possible for a prisoner to get authorisation to keep authorised property. Mr Smith became bald and was given permission under that legislation to have his hairpiece. The decision was revoked after he escaped whilst on temporary release. Now, I interpolate here that he was wearing his headpiece when he escaped, but there was no suggestion that it was used to facilitate the escape. 
he made his way to Brazil where he was arrested and then returned to New Zealand. When the decision was made uh, by the prison authorities that he could no longer wear the hairpiece, no reasons were given for that decision. He sought judicial review on, the, on various grounds, including a failure to take it into account a relevant consideration, that is, his right to freedom of expression. In the trial court, Mr Smith was successful on that ground. He failed in the Court of Appeal on the basis that there was no breach of his right to freedom of expression. And by then the prison had said that he could have the hairpiece, so the case was moot. I'm not referring to the case in relation to the concept of freedom of expression per se, but in terms of amenability to review. The submission made uh, by the Crown at the trial court was that this was an operational decision in a prison managerial context, which, and that, that those factors should be relevant both to the reviewability and also to the availability of the remedy. That submission was rejected by the trial court judge. The judge accepted that this was a relatively low level managerial decision made by someone who was not a lawyer, but nonetheless said that it was necessary to ensure that the statutory requirement to act fairly was maintained. The potential limit on rights was seen as, a, as an implicit mandatory relevant consideration in orthodox judicial review, review terms. The interest for me in this case in the present context is both as confirming the notion of expanding boundaries of public law, but it also links in, I think, to another theme of the conference, which is the impact of human rights and bills of rights on public law. And I think that's a feature which is only going to continue uh, to be an issue in the public law context going forward. The same point is made, for example, in a different context by our current chair in his paper on the so socialisation of private law. I note also uh, in reference to the prisoner case that there has been in the New Zealand context some impact of what David Feldman described as uh, having a number of articulate prisoners. We certainly have a couple who've, who've had uh, quite a lot of success in their judicial review proceedings, both in the context of uh, review relating to prisoners' rights um, and, um, and smoking in prisons. I think it's interesting to think and reflect about what it is that brings about these changes in the frontiers, and there's been plenty of thought food for thought on these topics in the various papers and in the discussion in the conference. To conclude, I just want to commend the organisers and say how much I appreciate the opportunity we've all had to benefit from the exchanges and the excellent papers. Thank you. Well, I heartily endorse uh, the last remarks. It's astonishing, both the sophistication and precision of the organisation and the generosity of spirit with which it's all been pursued. So I thank Jason and everyone else who has a red tag on behalf of the blue, <laughs> the blue people who are the guests, uh, and uh, this has been a, a, a exceptional. But I think really that marches with the extraordinary quality of the papers. Every single paper that I've heard or read, without exception, was really good. And I, I try to think if I've ever been to a conference like that, uh, on sitting on the scale, it's a, and, and I think that reflects the tradition of this conference uh, and in its spectacular future. Uh, so if, if, my, my remarks are a little bit miscellaneous, probably from the kind of person I am. Uh, there have been an element, though, of the um, international law dimension, which is what I think Jason hoped I would bring to this. Um, uh, but uh, initially, I, I, sorry, I'm going to make five points in five categories. So uh, first is uh, I, I was struck by both the theme, but also the that it's not at the center of the articulation, even though everyone has opinions about it here. And maybe it's a good theme for a future conference, uh, which is really about the purposes of public law. Uh, and several, many papers interrogated those but not always so directly, and there are lots of possibilities. I wouldn't miss them much, uh, except to say that 
uh, one could think of justice as being one of those purposes. Uh, and uh, that, that was there. Uh, maybe you could imagine that being there a bit more. I was very struck by the phrase uh, from the Uluru Declaration of the Heart, the torment of powerlessness. And that seems to catch a lot. Uh, we're working a lot on disregard as a something a little bit similar. Uh, second, I was uh, on that theme of purposes, I'm very struck by what Carol Harlow said about liberty. Uh, the, the US, where I live, is full to the brim of liberty things, and liberty postage stamps and statues and universities and so forth. But I think she's absolutely right. It's dropped out, and as it starts to come under glimmers of threat, seems to be the time to re-energize that. So, uh, my, uh, second is, is I think there's an implicit theme, but again, not as explicit here, uh, about the conditions in which public law public lawyers are operating, uh, and sometimes they're preconditions almost for public law, uh, and they're again often a bit taken for granted in a more uh, overlapping environment where more people share much the same. Uh, and in the case of the groups at this conference, mainly people from very stable polities, uh, 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 in many cases democratic and uh, uh, quite secure uh, and with strong courts, et cetera. So that's not the world. So the conferences and things I'm usually at, people I work with a lot, very often are beleaguered. One could feel some of that in this conference also. Uh, sometimes the jurisprudence, the institutions are very degraded. Sometimes they're degraded on purpose. And what's very striking, and I think to have in mind, is how recently some have been degraded, which weren't before. Uh, and the very rapid strategies of lawful degradation of institutions, including independent courts, independent constitutional courts. Uh, and, and I think that Insight is a reminder that when things are going well is the time to buttress them and to think through what could go wrong uh, and not wait until it started. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, we, we also, in many contexts, have this element of violence. Of course, there's one idea that law is really about, the justification for, for the proper use of violence by the state, the management of violence, but also the context of social violence of different sorts. And that was in, in lots of the papers, uh, but again, maybe a little less centrally. Um, uh, it, so that one set of the conditions, those kind, I think. Uh, it, it's sort of second, not, not surprisingly from someone like me, are the kind of macro conditions of, of, of the wider global or regional orders uh, in, in which any particular polity in its public law are embedded, and again, I think that can be sometimes taken for granted until it's in question, uh, and I think the, the world is shifting. Now the tectonic plates are moving a little bit. We already feel occasional shocks and bumps from it, and how, how much that will go and with what effect, I think is, I think it's a, a really live set of themes. So, uh, but I think also more, more specifically, uh, this question of the relationship of state and market, which is kind of implicit in a lot of the liberal constitutionalizing, I think there's going to be questions about how that carries on. Uh, there's increasing mercantilism of different sorts already, uh, and uh, the, the kind of interstate competition. Uh, there are, I think, dimensions of, of contra-globalization, uh, as well as the assumptions about globalization that have prevailed up until now. Uh, and it, uh, I think also some of the themes about how the states work, uh, for example, on the contracting theme, uh, and Davis mentioned the way in which the government contracting in the UK is constrained somewhat by the procurement rules which come from the European Union. We can add the World Trade Organization for many countries. TPP has a whole chapter on government procurement. And I think we could say the same about investment law. And it's very striking, the bilateral investment treaties, the multilateral ones, <coughs> TPP, here uh, have quite significant effects on the government changing its mind, another government changing its mind, a democratic government changing its mind, and this quite odd situation where in the investment law world, you hear phrases where people are celebrating or trying to defend the idea of the state has a right to regulate. Yeah, so, 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 so I just transpose that into this world. <laughs> of course it has a right to regulate, that's what it is. Uh, but it's a, the context, it's a rather limited and it was, it has to be defended, uh, it's a different world. Uh, but I think also uh, these questions about it in the kind of global order that there is, the way in which states can pool their operations, pool their procurement, for example, especially very small states, but lots of others uh, to deal with. Uh, the scale of global corporations uh, and uh, the scale of global power. And I think those need to be thought more affirmatively uh, that rather than the territorially defined boundaries of a lot of that. Uh, so 
that, that, that's on the uh, conditions also. A, a, a third one, which is not a condition, but it's, it's a thing which strikes me, the international law world is full to the brim of consensus. I mean, there isn't much actual consensus, but the, the idea of consensus is everywhere. Well, we shouldn't have a vote, or decide, and there's, of course, the power structures are masked, uh, not very much by that, but it's uh, part of the way of thinking. And it struck me that at the core of the ordinary public law discussions here is not there. There is an assumption there's a way of deciding, it's decided, it doesn't matter if it's consensus or not. But when it moves to the uh, indigenous questions, for example, it was very much at the centre of the Australian discussions and others, and I think in a few other contexts also, more divided societies, more fundamentally difficult issues. Uh, and that's an interesting theme, I think, how to, uh, with that is fruitfully built in from one to the other. Okay, so that's on the elements of the conditions. Uh, like, like my kind of third point of theme, really, is uh, to, to think a little bit about the, the, the degree to which there is and needs, to, or degree to which there also needs to be a, a, a totally close coupling between the idea of public law and the idea of the state. And of course, we grew up with the idea that public law is about the state, and if there's international, public international law, it's about things between states. Um, I think we saw in this conference really to an impressive degree, and I think in two years' time in Canada, we would expect much the, the same dimensions, that the element of indigenous public law is more and more present now. And, and there's a really interesting question of what that means. Of course it means it can mean the public law of the state in relation to indigenous people or the terms of indigenous state interaction. Uh, but I think it could also mean the way in which indigenous groups self-constitute and to define and announce themselves in the world, tribal constitutionalism as one. And I think there was an element of that, of indigenous organization, indigenous representation. How are we going to do it? Which Joe Gallagher and, and Uncle Ron Jones were speaking of and presenting here. Um, and, and I think infusing that straight away introduces an interesting plurality, the inter-public law questions, uh, as opposed to the subsumption of them. So, and a third, I think, is about corporations. Uh, again, wasn't as much of a theme here as it is in a lot of the work I'm involved with. Uh, but I think there it's really worth trying to expand thinking about it, to think, if, if we think just type just as an example of lots of possible, Facebook is almost a global corporation, not quite, uh, is an oddity of each country or regulator trying to get to grips with it. And the experience of who Facebook sends to which parliament when they're having a committee hearing is kind of striking already. It's a power and market gradient and other things. So, but you could, it, it's, it's liberating thinking about it. We could imagine trying to have a regulator who is wherever Facebook is instead of this kind of fragmented structure of the states struggling with their traditional methods. And I think that more kind of expansive, liberated thinking, lateral thinking, I guess, it may be fruitful. Okay, so, so that's a third zone about the coupling. Uh, a, a fourth theme or topic, uh, which is really because I'm much interested in it, is uh, digital. The, the, the impl implications of digitalization uh, for almost everything, uh, and including in the public law. Space. There were several really interesting papers on elements of that. Of course, there's a lot of good work on privacy, uh, information regulation. Uh, there was a, a, a very interesting paper on online courts, administrative courts, and that's going to be a very fast move. Uh, of course, private companies offer the same kind of thing. Amazon, if you have a dispute with someone else on there, there's an intricate layered system of mediation, et cetera. Uh, but I, I think going beyond that, uh, it, it's going to be very important to think about the way in which governments operate as digital entities. Of course, that's a central theme in every modern government now, how to do it. Robo, welfare compliance stuff, uh, the, the methods of trying to oust the people and the humanity from the process. But also the way in which uh, the hard baking of a, a legal standard of some sort into a computer code thing, it takes out the human discretion. That you, you, don't, you no longer have a choice to say, I'm not going to obey that law. I'm going to do civil disobedience about that. Uh, because it's, it's not possible. There is no place to click. I disobey this. Uh, the, the, the structure is predetermined much more heavily. And it, so it could take away the kind of individual autonomy in the relation to law. Uh, at least I think it's something to think of, and several people have written about that. And I think a th further layer is, is, the, is the way in which law might become, if it is law, in which activities of government might become personalized in the sense of the same way you now, different people get a different price for the same thing from a big online platform, depending how rich you are, what else you've searched for, what else is known about you and your profile, et cetera. So the same way you can imagine the law coming out differently for different people. 
uh, profiled in their individualized data from the massive aggregations, it, it built into that. Maybe for very good reasons. It may be a more supple and, and justifiable even, but it does come at a cost of a lot of standard rule of law thinking uh, and very interesting challenges for public law, which is tend to be assumed to be generality, as we've just heard in some of the papers, uh, is, is one of the assumptions of it. Uh, and finally, I think data law. Uh, I think the building in of data law to public law, the, the way governments need data, where, where is data going to be held, the flows of it uh, uh, is really important. We're doing a project on this at NYU Global Data Law. But, uh, but I, I think it's really a lot to, more to be done there beyond privacy. OK, and then my final uh, it's a, a mild point, really, is a, is a kind of my fifth category is a sort of epistemic one about what, 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 what does it mean to, what is knowledge in these different areas of public law? And it's quite striking, uh, coming from the same kind of common law background, uh, but how much in this kind of gathering, uh, how central courts are. Uh, and and the, the statements of courts, the question of what they think, how they're being thought, et cetera. No, 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 but it's quite a feature, of course, as you'd expect, less so in the global administrative law space, et cetera. Uh, but but this, this assumption of juridification uh, is quite strong there. Uh, and I think it does invite, uh, it, it, several of the papers in the conference dealt with this very th thoughtfully, I think the kind of non-curial elements, the political constitutionalism, uh, the, the, the role of directive principles in a constitution, for example, was an, an excellent paper, where the aim is not to have them adjudicated, but to have them inf being influential when they are. Uh, but I think also this background theme of when, when does it turn? When does there become, uh, as was put in one discussion, uh, a, a rejection of the idea that these are so-called judges because they have become political, that the outcomes are driving it, it's, it's, it's lost, that, that sort of detachment from the politics. Uh, and and, and it, it, that may be happening for reasons which aren't political. Uh, and I think this is a real challenge of overburdened courts, degradation, and this very interesting question which seems to come from that of the role of the academics in relation to this. Uh, is it to be a kind of canary, to begin to warn early when things are going a bit wrong? And the courts say, is it to sort of try to keep faith with the courts and, and preserve the insulation of those things, uh, but, or is it to voice other views? Uh, it's quite striking, really, that in many places there's a suspicion of fundamental rights uh, for lots of different reasons, uh, including on the left and sort of labor side some places. It doesn't really come through so much in the public law discussion, which would be very pro those things. So uh, I, I just go to that uh, track. To, to say that it's, it's kind of an interesting issue, uh, thinking from the international law side, it, how far it's possible to frame things with the same kind of objectives, uh, but without having courts quite so centre, or what can be added to it, and if it's added to it, does it change the nature of the knowledge, uh, or just the voice, or just make it more? And, and, and I think I just float that because it's very much in my mind, and probably in all of ours. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's been a real honour to be here. Can I just start by echoing the remarks of others about what a terrific conference this has been? The standard of the papers has been truly excellent, and indeed the standard of the contributions from the participants in the audience. Um, can I say my only complaint is that it's been too difficult to choose between the parallel sessions, uh, and I do feel that having made certain choices, I've missed out, uh, having heard from other people that there were other excellent sessions. So of course, what I'm going to reflect on is the sessions that I attended. Um, but that is necessarily a partial reflection on the conference as a whole. And as I'm sure you'd all understand, my reflections are, of course, personal and don't necessarily reflect the views of my government. Uh, as a practitioner, I found the conference particularly stimulating uh, in relation to those papers that encouraged a more um, theoretical uh, approach to public law questions. Um, it's, all, of course, helpful to practitioners to get practical papers, but um, I do value the opportunity to think more deeply about our work as public lawyers, an opportunity that I don't find I always get when I'm trying to run litigation or provide um, urgent advice to government. And so just one example, I particularly enjoyed Ros Dixon's paper on responsive judicial review and unresponsive legislatures and the ways in which judicial review um, can go beyond the individual remedy that might be sought in the case and be what she described as action forcing in terms of prompting a legislative response. Now, the overarching theme of the conference, as we all know, was the frontiers of public law. Um, that theme was further described in the conference material as intended to invite engagement with a range of questions concerning 
boundaries, both within public law and the boundaries of public law. Um, interesting to me that both the words boundaries and frontiers were used. The concept of frontiers suggests to me that the boundaries aren't fixed, that they can shift and they're permeable, or at least they're capable of shifting. Uh, in terms of addressing the theme, I think the conference has been a resounding success. I think certainly all the speakers I heard engaged with the notion of boundaries, borders and frontiers, um, both in terms of what counts as public law and some of the boundaries between, say, public law and private law, public law and criminal law, and what doesn't, uh, as well as the boundaries within public law, such as the boundaries of judicial review. One notable theme that emerged, and uh, Dame Ellen addressed this to some extent as well, was uh, the way in which government contracts are dealt with by public law. And one could say that government contracts themselves are a frontier of public law in that they're becoming more, I think, over time, a significant way in which governments govern and yet public law has yet necessarily caught up with that development. Uh, and public law, I think, needs to develop ways to ensure that government contracts can be subject to scrutiny and review and accountability mechanisms. And certainly the speakers who addressed government contracts really engaged, I think, both with the external boundaries of public law and uh, government contracts and the internal boundaries. So Janet McLean's paper, um, addressed the failure of contract law, private law, to grapple sufficiently with some of the distinctive features of government contracts and persuasively put the case for a distinct law of public contracts. Um, and Janet proposed, and I think certainly I found this very persuasive, that really all government contracts should be regarded as public contracts amenable to public law remedies without the need to identify some additional feature of the contract that can be described as a public element. I think that course is essential if we're to properly grapple with the ways uh, that government contracts impact on governance and individual rights. One aspect of public contracts and government contracts that wasn't discussed was the idea of statutory contracts, um, which raise their own set of distinct issues. Perhaps they're less favoured uh, currently because I think the executive often tends to try to use contracts as a way to avoid uh, the need to obtain parliamentary approval for certain courses of action. But certainly historically, there have been statutory contracts, and that, of course, crystallises the contract into a form of law, um, but poses its own questions of the ways in which contract law operates on a statutory contract and the way in which such a contract might be varied or even terminated. So that, to me, was an aspect of government contracting that that perhaps wasn't um, addressed in any of the sessions that I um, attended. And I think the questions around government contracts are important because if we do put boundaries around what public law can do in relation to government contracts, we are to an extent enabling governments to sidestep judicial review and other transparency and accountability mechanisms in the provision of government services and the expenditure of government money. And that has implications uh, as a number of the speakers said, for citizens, both individually as people receiving services that are provided on a contractual basis, but also collectively as the beneficial owners of the public fisc. And Ken Hayne emphasised on the first day the need to ask fundamental questions about how public law engages with government contracts. I think both Anne Davies and Janet McLean took up that challenge admirably, um, but I think it's also an area that remains ripe for further work. Another boundary addressed in one of the sessions that I attended was justiciability, which I see as an internal boundary erected to exclude certain kinds of governmental decision making from judicial supervision. Um, and Janina Bowie gave a fascinating paper concerning the justiciability decision of decisions to withdraw from treaties, contrasting the way that was dealt with recently, of course, in the UK in the Miller case with the US case in the 1970s uh, of Goldwater. And demonstrating, I think, that the frontiers of justiciability have moved significantly in that realm and I think probably in other realms as well. Um, the areas of governmental action that the courts now regard as non-justiciable in the sense that the courts simply have no role to play at all are really ever decreasing. And that was also, I think, um, something that emerged from David Feldman's paper on the changing boundaries between criminal law and public law. And he reflected um, 
on the move from a system where effectively in the UK, and I would say similarly in Australia, there was no public law supervision of police, prisons and prosecutors uh, to judicial review now being available for all of those areas of criminal justice in the UK. I think the movement has probably been less here in Australia. In that context, I think um, one can also consider the contest between the executive and the legislature on the one hand and the courts on the other about where the borders of judicial review should lie. And in that context, Martin Hinton and Fiona MacDonald uh, addressed the use of privative clauses by the legislature to attempt to limit judicial review, an attempt that in Australia has been largely um, unsuccessful. And indeed, what we do see is the legislature coming up with new ways to try to curtail and place boundaries around judicial review and then the courts pushing back. Most recently in Australia, a provision that wasn't a privative clause, but a provision that um, certainly sought to make judicial review more difficult by preventing the Minister for Immigration from being required to divulge or communicate certain information to the High Court in the exercise of that's court, that court's constitutional review jurisdiction uh, was recently held to be invalid by the Australian High Court in the Graham case uh, decided late last year. And the, the court really went back to first principles of public law, that all power of government is limited by law and those limits must be capable of enforcement by the courts. And the court said, given that the constitutional role of the High Court in judicial review, that what Parliament cannot do is enact a law which has the legal or practical operation of denying to a court the ability to enforce the legislated limits of an officer's power. And so the, court, the Parliament had been relatively ingenious, I think, in trying to come up with a new barrier, practical barrier, to judicial review, but the courts have been equally ingenious in... Uh, invalidating that attempt. And that focus on the practical effect seemed to me to have some parallels with the Unison case, which also attracted quite a bit of attention at the conference uh, over the last two days, both in Lord Mance's opening address as well as in various other papers. Because Unison also focused on the practical effect of court fees on access to justice. And the court held there that the practical effect of the high fees was to render nugatory rights that had been conferred by the parliament. And seen in that light, one could say that although in form Graham, the High Court's decision in Graham focused really on the court's jurisdiction, um, it can be also understood as a case about access to justice, even though the court itself didn't use that framework um, of analysis. I did want to um, say something um, in conclusion about... Um, public law and Indigenous peoples, because I think this is um, a significant area for public law, particularly in Australia, which of course is my background. Um, can I start by acknowledging that it might be slightly problematic to speak of public law frontiers in the context of Indigenous law um, and Indigenous rights, but putting that to one side, uh, the engagement of Indigenous peoples with public law and vice versa seems to me to be a key issue for the future, especially in Australia, uh, and one I hope that will receive further attention at future conferences. I think looking at the Australian picture, one can certainly say that public law in Australia has offered some remedies to Indigenous peoples, um, particularly perhaps around uh, land rights, the Native Title Act and so forth. Um, but it's clearly proved inadequate to uh, sufficiently address key issues of relevance to Indigenous peoples to date. And so I think a really exciting development in Australia is the recent passage in Victoria of the Advancing the Treaty Process with Aboriginal Victorians Act, passed very recently here in Victoria. Uh, and I don't know if Jill Gallagher is still here, but can I thank her for her terrific paper on that? Um, and I'm so delighted that she's going to be, in a sense, leading the development of the treaty process. As Jill explained, the, the, the Act really just starts a process to work towards the development of treaties with Aboriginal peoples in Victoria. Um, but it is, in the Australian context, a radical departure from traditional public law approaches to Indigenous issues and, I hope, holds great potential for the development of public law in relation to Indigenous peoples and their rights. 
Now, in that context, of course, I think Victoria will have a great deal to learn from other jurisdictions that have treaties with Indigenous peoples already. And some mention was made um, earlier today about perhaps the differences between the historical treaties and some of the more contemporary treaties that have been developed in Canada. And certainly New Zealand and Canada will be fairly obvious places for um, Victorian lawyers to look to in terms of the ways in which treaties can be developed, how they can be negotiated, who should negotiate them uh, and what they might contain, and then what is their status once they've been negotiated. Also, of course, and this did get some mention also, um, Australia's international obligations, including in particular the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, will inform the development of Indigenous treaty law in Australia. And so it will make, I think, international law an essential tool for public lawyers working in this space. An interesting question that occurred to me is that, or will be, I think, in the future, how public law and legal institutions respond to any legal challenges that are brought under even just this first act, which attempts to set up a representative body um, that can then engage in a negotiation process. So we can perhaps expect, I mean, we don't yet know, of course, but one might think there would be potentially challenges to the composition of the Aboriginal representative body, challenges to the treaty-making processes that are developed, and ultimately, of course, if treaties are negotiated uh, and agreed, challenges to the treaties and their content. And that question, I think, has to be considered in the context where, at least for public law, we're mostly dealing with the Supreme Court. Uh, and in Victoria, we have no Indigenous judges on the Supreme Court. Uh, so we're dealing with effectively settler law and lawyers uh, ultimately potentially engaging in a public law overlay of a treaty process that is at least pursuant to the Act, designed to give a great deal of autonomy to Indigenous people in terms of how they uh, speak, who speaks for them, and so forth. Um, as Debbie Mortimer pointed out in her paper this afternoon, courts and practitioners do tend to approach issues of representation of Indigenous peoples from the perspective of of traditional democratic values of majority uh, decision making without paying sufficient recognition to collective and other cultural indigenous decision making processes. And in that regard, I found Jill Gallagher's remarks about combining a democratic model with an elders council um, particularly significant and very interesting. Also relevant, I think, to the way in which Victoria's treaty process might play out was Mary Liston's paper this afternoon on Indigenous representation um, in the Canadian context. And she posed the question of who has voices in the relevant process and who represents Indigenous communities. And those are key questions that are going to arise in Victoria in the context of the treaty process. In Canada, um, Mary's paper explained some models for choosing representatives are imposed by legislation. And of course, if you've got a legislative framework, you would expect there would be some judicial review. But others um, use traditional customary law methods to choose Indigenous representatives. And that customary law power is not conferred by statute uh, and can be regarded, of course, as a power the Aboriginal bands always had. Um, independently of any settler law. But what has occurred is that in the Canadian context, the customary law decision-making processes are not shielded from judicial review. They're really treated as if they're decisions made under statutes. But it does seem that some creative remedies have been deployed in at least some cases to try to ensure um, consultation with Indigenous peoples and to bring a degree of deference to Indigenous decision-making around representation, recognising Indigenous expertise around facts, context and Indigenous customary law. So I think all of those things will be incredibly valuable in informing the way in which public lawyers and public law engages with the treaty process in um, Victoria. <coughs> Also, I think the Victorian treaty process in the Australian context is a very interesting example of federalism in action because we're operating in circumstances where a national treaty seems practically very difficult, if not impossible, and so more local state-based action towards a treaty or treaties 
um, is possible and can provide then potentially a working example that can be followed by, developed, built on by other states, as Jill Gallagher mentioned. But finally, of course, in a federal context, that raises potential issues of inconsistency between state laws, treaty law and any treaties that might emerge, and federal laws, in which case, of course, federal law prevails. So there could be issues about the validity of a regime that confers special benefits on Aboriginal people, given the Racial Discrimination Act. Now, it might in that context be necessary to justify the Treaty Act and other um, steps that follow under it as special measures under the Racial Discrimination Act, as discussed by Kirsty Gover in her paper. But that itself might be thought to undermine the fundamental status and nature of a treaty, which on one view ought not to be regarded as a special measure, but really as a recognition of um, the traditional uh, claims of Aboriginal people. So to me, that the, the question of Indigenous rights was one of the most interesting issues that I encountered at the conference. And um, I certainly hope that the next conference, which I also hope to attend, um, will have even more consideration of those issues. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. I, I feel I've drawn the short straw here, but um, I'll try to keep it shorter than and all of these notes, I uh, don't want to go through the, the various papers and reflect on them. I think the, the last three have already done a fair bit of that. And, and in any event, um, they're, they're so brilliant. Um, and we've had so many, which I've not been able to hear. I've only been, I, I've gone to all of the sessions that I could um, from eight o'clock till whenever, but, but um, um, inevitably one misses some and and I'm looking forward to using Dropbox and 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 getting the rest. What I thought I'd like I'd like to do is to question why this conference and its two predecessors has been so successful. Is it simply um, Jason and others call for papers with lovely themes indicated? Probably not. Um, the themes were fairly capacious, but I'll go through the themes and then, then come out with why it's probably not. And why there's such an enthusiastic response um, in terms of audience attendance um, and participation. It's sometimes fairly easy to spot the reasons for an enthusiastic response. And I remember Mike Taggart organising a conference in Saskatchewan in the late or mid, I think, 1990s. Everybody went. And everybody wanted to talk about privatisation and outsourcing <coughs> and a lot of them to oppose it um, with a view to preserving what they thought was the best of the public domain. The reasons were plain for that enthusiasm because we were all at roughly the same time experiencing a reconfiguration of the administrative state. Um, the reasons, aside from the Indigenous issues, the reasons for the enthusiasm and interest in this conference are not so obviously political. In fact, the reasons might in part, I suggest, be put down to the pressures from the legal academy and to changing styles in the academy. And I'll get back to that later. Jason and his team have organised uh, or stipulated conference themes for each of the conferences, 2014, 16 and 18. Back in 2014, the theme was a distinction between substance and process. In other words, its primary focus was on the internals of public law, its content, if you like. Looking at the papers that eventually appeared in the edited collection, um, the great bulk of them dealt with the development of substantive review of administrative action. There were some papers that looked as much at the administration as at the law, at the effects of judicial review, at its remedies, at comparative borrowings. But the primary starting point was the doctrinal drift to substantive review and how that could be justified or criticised, urged on or restrained. None of that was anywhere near as urgent as the political upheavals and reorganisation of state services 
that had so animated Taggart's conference. Perhaps the great success of 2014 could in part at least be put down to the fact that it was the only one in town for, for, common law, for the common law world. It was unique in that respect. 2016, unity of public law, with a very clever question mark, well done. Um, that essentially saw papers splitting into, into roughly equal parts, if you look at the book that came out of that. Self-conscious comparativism and doctrinal analysis. In both cases, there was a marked turn to theory compared to 2014. And once again, um, Brexit aside, there were no great social or political upheavals to explain this. This year's theme, themes are about boundaries, or they called it frontiers, and it certainly pushed back the frontiers of ignorance, for me at least. Um, the boundaries between public law's internal compartments, the boundaries between law that's public, private, indigenous, international, global. Frontiers are notoriously porous, and it was interesting to hear people analysing the effects of cross-border flows between the various compartments. Speaking as an Australian, and I think I, I, this point's been, been made already by Chris, um, I was especially pleased to see so much attention being devoted to Indigenous issues here, um, and especially with the session with Jill Gallagher's paper. Um, these are issues that won't be going away, um, as perhaps the federal government might have hoped. The organisers for this year have spread the papers around several themes. The most urgent themes, it seems to me, apart from Indigenous issues, is executive overreach. Papers responded to the rise of authoritarianism, the expansionary claims to executive power. In a sense, this is core territory for constitutional lawyers and administrative lawyers. The linkages between external political events and scholarly concerns are fairly obvious here and every bit as urgent as at Taggart's conference. Authoritarian inclined governments used to claim to speak for the silent majority but it's a long time since we've heard that term because social media has made it a nonsense. Governments now claim to speak for the people in terms that deliberately challenge the very legitimacy of the judicial branch and sometimes of the parliamentary branch. Several presentations at this conference focused on the UK Supreme Court setting itself up as a preferable, sometimes superior, form for articulating broad um, or even inventing broad um, governance norms. The contrast with Australia is, to me, very striking. It seems to me that some of our senior judges are lacking in the self-confidence they once had when they resisted privative clauses and such like. Um, their moves are much smaller, much more deferential. M68, the case concerned with our Guantanamo at, at Nauru is an obvious example. Other themes developed in this conference were perhaps less urgent than in the indigenous issues and um, the executive overreach in, in, in migration and so on, um, but more like the doctrinal and theoretical concerns of 2016. <coughs> Papers explored the boundaries and sometimes the collapse of them between criminal law and public law, constitutional and administrative, indigenous and national, we also heard papers exploring the status and moral claims of the administrative state, um, although interestingly enough, these came from Canada and Singapore, um, not the UK and not the United States. In the United States, some scholars and many politicians oppose now the very existence of the administrative state. Um, I refer to Philip Hamburger's book, um, Is Administrative Law Illegal? There was a, a review article of that, and the title of which was simply, no. Um, um, it's an interesting book. In political terms, it casts the administrative state, I don't support it, but as a reincarnation of the Stuart pretensions to absolute prerogative power, with statutes sometimes, but not necessarily. In doctrinal terms, that's political terms, in doctrinal terms, 
they propose a separation of the judicial power that appears to be far stricter than anything we've previously known. And then there's Brexit. I'd wrongly predicted that we'd have more Brexit-themed papers, because it's a pretty important issue. Jason Faruhas and others are saying that the UK courts have been repositioning themselves in readiness for some cataclysmic changes um, and watering down of human rights and that they've been deliberately, as a strategic move, been casting the common law as always having had, or at least now have, having, um, those uh, human rights. For some, they go even further and elevate them in human rights to constitutional or fundamental status. Well, I'm not quite sure of how that would happen and how it would play out. Um, there have so far been a few threats and references were made to Trevor Allen's work in particular to parliamentary supremacy in this context. But if I can adopt Michael Frayn's um, terminology, they seem to be, on the whole, for me, noises off. They're made by judges in after-dinner speeches or conference speeches and by academics, but not on the bench, on the whole. Jackson, yes, a few rattling of sabres, but not much. The frontiers and boundaries theme of this conference also attracted work from scholars on the intersections of public, international and domestic law. OK, thanks. Um, for the first time so far, that theme was pushed further with discussions of whether we are seeing national law losing place to the dictates of large multinational corporations or perhaps global administrative law. At the same time, the popular media analysis has it that the process is actually going in reverse. Look at all of the kerfuffle over the trade war as it's developing. That we're in fact in the midst of a crisis, we're told, a breakdown of a rules-based international order. I've tried so far to see some connections between the external political and economic events on the one hand and the extraordinary uptake of interest in these conferences, but I suspect that I've been clutching at straws. It might have been more productive if I tried to link the thematic changes to these conferences with changing styles within the academy. This all leaves me wondering whether the next time we meet, which will be in, Tor in Toronto, no, wait a minute, Ottawa, we should devote some more time to mapping the connections between public law's intellectual currents and the changes going on around us, both within the academy as well as further afield. Within the legal academy, doctoral theses seem to me to be heading further and further towards taxonomical inquiries or modelling. Sometimes they're grand along the lines of public or private. Usually, dare I say it, they're more useful. Um, but they do seem to be more assertive about the doctoral candidate's own normative preferences and more concerned with shaping doctrine to fit those preferences, to squeeze those preferences cases in, into those preferences sometimes. They seem to me to be less concerned than previously with engaging with the political and economic norms that are so obviously shaping the administrative state. <coughs> Finally, I'm not suggesting that next time when we meet up in Ottawa, we should abandon law for politics or administrative law for administration per se, or law for an academic critique of, of academic fashions and pressures. But the intellectual history of administrative and constitutional law is, to me, an interesting field in its own right. So perhaps we might have a session or two looking at those issues. Um, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much to our panel who have expertly uh, teased out a number of the core uh, themes that have emerged over the last two and a bit days and also provided us uh, a, 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 lot for, a lot more to reflect on as, as we leave uh, today and going forward. I'd also like to take this opportunity uh, to once more thank our conference sponsor, Hart Publishing, uh, for their generous support and we very much look forward to working together on the conference into uh, the future. Now, as I said in my opening remarks, and as has been touched on by some of the speakers,
uh, we chose the theme of the frontiers of public law to encourage exploration not only of the constraints on and limits of public law, but also the possibilities for legal development and legal thought at public law's outer edges. And uh, I, I think the last two days have realized uh, this vision. The papers presented have been genuinely exciting and I think refreshing, inviting consideration of new and important issues and producing rich debate and new perspectives across a range of contexts. Multiple frontiers have been traversed, including the frontiers, if they exist, between domestic and international law, public and private, between public law and indigenous law, culture and norms, between public law and public administration, between state and federal power, and the frontiers of legislative, executive and judicial power. And I think the conference has demonstrated amply the idea that we often learn the most about a field from examining its edges. Uh, it's been a very great pleasure to host you all at Melbourne uh, Law School over the last two and a bit days. We wish you a safe journey home and we look forward to seeing you in Ottawa in June 2020. Thank you. <laughs>